Brooklyn, my boy. Welcome to our home. The um, lecture this week on my thoughts is, are you, are you happy with who, who you are? Well, I would like to begin this week's my thoughts with a story. The story is told about legendary Lubavitch Chassid. In fact, once in fact, I even had the honor of meeting, Remendel Futterfuss, who had spent 14 years in a Soviet gulag, a hard labor camp. One evening, he was sitting around talking with three other prisoners, and as you can imagine, they were all depressed. Each one was lamenting about his own uh, tales of woe. So one began to speak, and he said that before being arrested and sent to this camp, I was a successful and prominent doctor. My career was booming. But then suddenly I was arrested for dealing in the black market. Look at me now. I am a prisoner in this labor camp. Then another of the men present spoke out, and he said that before I was arrested, I was a high-ranking official in the Communist Party. I held the keys to power in my hands. Then out of the blue came the orders from on high that I should be sent to this hard labor camp. Look at me. Look at me now. I am a prisoner in this godforsaken gulag. The third man decided that he too should tell his story, and he began. He said that he was a professor. He said, I was leading a quiet but peaceful academic life with my wife and family. Then one day, one of my published articles was termed counter-revolutionary by the party. Now, look where I am. I'm a prisoner in this forsaken labor camp. Well, the three men then turned to Rip Mendel. They said to him, what about you, Mendel? What were you before you were arrested? He said to them, really, I don't know what you're talking about. You see, before I was arrested, I was a chassid of the Rebbe. And now, I'm still a chassid of the Rebbe. Being in prison can't change that. He continued, you see, your civilian lives were all dependent on external factors. Therefore, you feel an acute pain when they are gone. My life, on the other hand, has always been focused on the internal. And therefore, I am not crushed, even in these harsh conditions. We live in a time where people seem to be depressed about so many things. It seems that the concept of sameach b'chelko, of being content with what one has, no longer exists. I think that it's quite normal to ask the question as to why God created you to be the person whom you are. Why did he create you to be a man and not a woman or, or vice versa? Why did he make you short instead of tall, fat instead of skinny, poor instead of rich? Now, why are some other people smarter than you are? Why are some people easily addicted to drugs or alcohol, others to food, sex, money, or even honor? Why are some people attracted to members of the same sex? Why are others born with a proclivity towards blood? And others who are kleptomaniacs, those who experience great pleasure out of feeling anything? Why are some people sickly and others healthy? Why are some people bipolar? OCD, ADD, autistic. You know, the list goes on and on, and it's really quite long. Well, what does all this mean? I think that God has created all of us as individuals, unique, something that only a God could do. We may all be unique, but that does not mean that we agree with exactly how God has decided to create us. Wouldn't it have been nice if, he could have, if we could have had a voice in who we were created. But somehow, God didn't, didn't ask us. He just created us as he saw fit. Today we live in an age where people have the ability to change certain physical features that God has given us. You know, a nose job is one thing, but a sex change, well, that's a whole different matter. I think that given a choice, we would all change something about ourselves, at least physically. You know, I would have liked to be about six foot four. You know, maybe then I could have dunked a basketball. Not exactly earth shattering, but I thought it would be nice. I'm not sure if anyone, especially women, are totally happy with their physical appearance or attributes. You know, transgender seems to be in vogue today. If you stop and think about it, everyone is created from a zygote, an egg that resides within their mother's womb. That zygote is neither male nor female, it's both. It is a sperm which is produced by the male partner that determines what the sex of the baby will be. 
But in the end, whatever gender becomes dominant, both possibilities existed initially. However, though the sex of a child is determined in the womb, that does not mandate that their personality will be either masculine or feminine. For one, I believe that if you look at people in general, you'll, you will observe that each of us is a composite of both genders. You will find men with feminine character traits and women with masculine character traits. It's not our genitalia that necessarily dictate what our personality will be. You know, we are far from carbon copies of each other. In fact, there are nine different physical features that are unique to every individual. They are your iris, ear, lip, print, tongue, voice, finger and toe print, teeth, retina, and gait. All of these traits are external, internally. Well, we are, for the most part, identical. We read in the Torah about Yosef HaTzadik. Though Yosef was born as a male, still he seemed to possess some very feminine character traits. The Torah records that he cries seven times, which is far more than any other person mentioned in the Torah. In addition, Rashi makes a comment that Yosef was known to adorn his eyes and style his hair. You know, there are very few straight men who would feel comfortable wearing eye makeup. We also read in the portion of Ayesha that his father, Yaakovino, Jacob, our father, gave him a katonus pasim, a gaudy coat made up of many colors. The reality is that many men would feel a bit you know, uncomfortable wearing something so colorful. Rather than wear it, they would most likely put it on a hanger deep in their closet and let it gather dust. Yet somehow, Yosef didn't feel that way. He was very comfortable wearing it in public as we read on further in the portion that he even wore the garment when he traveled to find his brothers, as it states in the portion of Ayesha, that they, the brothers, stripped him of his long, colorful coat that he was wearing. And Yosef was far from being gay. You know, cooking is seen by many as a task that is performed primarily by women. Yet many of the finest chefs in the world are men. In addition, many of the greatest designers of women's clothing are men. Our physical definition does not necessarily dictate which profession we must pursue. Women have held the highest positions in politics, medicine, high finance, the arts, and even in religion. Excellence and success are not dictated by gender. They are the product of God-given talents that operate in conjunction with time and effort expended to cultivate those talents. You know, people seem to think that if you change your sex, you change who you are. I find that to be a fallacy. Who you are is not predicated by your sex. It is predicated by who you are internally. Just like the story about Remendel. There are men who are more feminine by nature, and there are women who are more nas masculine. We are referring to their personalities, not to their sex. It makes little difference whether you push the door that says men or the one that says women when you enter a restroom. It is who you are internally that dictates who you really are. As the saying goes, Panemius Goreris Quitonius, that one's internal makeup will influence one's external demeanor. In addition, when, one, when a person thinks that they should have been someone other than the person that God created them to be, think about it, they are questioning the wisdom of God Almighty. One would think that God, the creator of all the universe, might have a sound reason for making us as we are. After all, we were all put in this world for a purpose. In order for us to fulfill that purpose, we were created by God Almighty exactly as we are. He has outfitted us with all the attributes that we would need to succeed in our mission in life. You know, disagreeing with God's choice can never end well. We have a belief based on Kabbalah that we are all old souls. We have all lived previous lives. These are referred to as Gilgulim. In previous lives, we have fulfilled certain requirements that we were expected to complete throughout our lifetimes. Think of it as a student who has graduated from college with a degree in accounting. In order for them to become a CPA, a certified public accountant, 
they are required to pass five exams. Now, almost everyone who has graduated from college will pass at least three of these exams. Some may pass four. However, it is very rare for anyone to pass all five on their first attempt. So they take the exams over until they pass all five. Once they do, they then receive their certificate, which bestows upon them the title of a CPA, a Certified Public Accountant. And so too in our present incarnation. In our previous lives, we have completed the majority of the tests God expects us to pass. We are in this present incarnation to complete the last of the exams that we have not yet finished. So what is our mission in our present lifetime? Well, think of all the things that you, you do not want to do. Then guess what? <laughs> that is most likely your challenge to go against your nature. God expects you to grow and to become a better person, a more spiritually motivated individual than you may have initially intended to be. So when people try to change who and what they are, they are counteracting the whole purpose of their creation into this physical world. God has dealt us our hand for a specific purpose. The challenge we face is that we are drawn to everything other than that which we are expected to correct. It's like trying to change the rules of the game because you can't win playing with the rules that exist now. As we learn from the story of Remendel Furtifus, you may be able to change the external dimension of who you are, but the essence, the essence of who you are really, are the internal, and that remains the same. We all need to take the cards that God has dealt us and find a way to turn our hand into a winner. God did not create us to be someone or something that we are not. The challenge that we all face in life is to use those attributes that we have been blessed with and fulfill our, fulfill our own unique mission. If we find some of the challenges difficult, then we are probably on the right path, as the saying goes. If you find no obstacles on the road, then you're probably on the wrong road. I think that's, that the society that we live in today that seems to promote transgender options this is the whole point of God and our purpose of living in this incarnation. God expects us to navigate through our lives with the sex and personality that he has created us with. How can we allow a child to make a decision about their sexuality when they are still so young? Hopefully as we live, we grow with time and maturity. We many times come to realize all the silly things that we did or wanted to do when we were young and foolish. When we look back on our lives, there are choices that we wish that we had made a better decision on when we were younger. Some of those decisions can still be corrected, and others, well, are more permanent. You know, there's a saying that if you have lemons, then you should make lemonade. The essence of life is not to change yourself, but to accept who you are, and then work on making yourself better. The problem that we face is that growth requires effort. The greater the challenge, the more difficult, it the more effort it demands. Many times when the going gets tough, well, we just give up or we cut corners so that we do not have to exert ourselves more than was necessary. Now, most of the time we are at best sprinters. For us to be successful in our mission in life, we must all be marathon runners. We never have permission to give up. We need to realize that life is not about changing. Life is about being who God meant us to be. You know, in the secular world, they, world, they talk about turning over a new leaf. We believe that we are all created perfect. Our mission in life is for us to remove the negativity that surrounds our godly soul. If we can accomplish that goal, we will be the beneficiary of all the good that God Almighty intended for us in this world and in the next. You know, the art museum in Florence, Italy, the Galleria dell'Accademia, is best known as the home of Michelangelo's famous sculptor of David. When he completed his masterpiece, he was asked, what was his inspiration for the piece? He answered that he did nothing other than remove the dross that surrounded David. And there he was. So too with all of us. God has created us perfect. We just need to remove all the dross 
that prevents us from reaching our true essence. So the bottom line, God Almighty created us with possibilities. It becomes the mission of each and every one of us to transform those possibilities into realities. We need to focus on the primary, not the secondary. Our emphasis should be to direct, be directed towards our internality, not our externality. And with that, we will hopefully reach the point of being happy with who we are. And with that, let us hope to usher in the coming of Sia Sukana quickly and in our time. Again, let me thank you for attending. God should bless you and yours with health, success, happiness, and all that's good. Again, Shabbat Shalom. Hope you enjoyed the lecture. Thank you.